Amen. All right, there in uh, 1 John chapter 5, look at verse number 13, where he says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. There where he says that he wants you to know that you have eternal life. Now, we're sort of continuing the series of what we've been preaching on on Sunday nights about strengthening your soul winning. And I really want to focus tonight on eternal life and knowing for sure that you have eternal life. Frankly, most people in the world, when you ask them, do you know for sure when you die you're going to heaven? Are you 100% sure? Hardly anybody will tell you I'm 100% sure. The Bible clearly says here that we should know. We should know for sure while we're still alive. In fact, if you don't know why you're still alive, it may be too late for you. Those that don't have confidence in what God has said, those that have not trusted in what God has said, then they're leaving it up to themselves. They're, they're trusting in their own works. And somebody that says, well, I'm 75% I'm sure. I'd be worried about that person. That person's probably not saved. I mean, when, when you're in school, if you get a 75, that's not a perfect grade. If you get a 99, that's not a perfect grade. And our faith ought to be that of 100% sure of the record of what God has given us, Amen. that His Son is God, that His Son is our Savior, that that's the only way to go to heaven, and we have to trust in it for sure to have everlasting life. So we're going to talk about the eternal security of the believer. We believe what the Bible, you know, that we are once, once you're saved, you're always saved. Amen. I don't have a problem with that phrase or that term. People will take shots at that. But you know, the Bible teaches it. When it says everlasting life, yeah. how long does that life last for? Is it temporary? No. Is it till you sin again? Do you get everlasting life and then you sin again and He takes it away so it didn't really last forever? You think about how, how contrary that would be just to the, to the simplicity of the language that's in the Gospel. Look at, look at verse 13 again. Look, He says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. It is up to you to believe these things. It's up to you to trust in these things, and then you'll know for sure. And a lot of times out soul winning, we run into people that have a well, is it Calvinism or Arminianism debate, and frankly, both of those are wrong. Right. Both of those are doctrines of men. Yea, I would say they're doctrines of devils. Yeah. To, to try to take away your confidence in what the Bible has said. And what God has said, He has finished it. The record's complete. Amen. If I have to go to seminary to understand salvation, then it's very difficult for anybody to get saved. Right, yeah. You think about how confusing people end up when they, when they study, well, this man said that, and then this man said this. Hey, what about what God said? Yeah. What about what the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, right? They wrote down these words yes. as God instructed them to. And that's what we trust in for salvation. We don't want people to be confused. Look at the next verse, verse number 14. And this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. There's three things in this verse I want to focus on tonight. One is that we have confidence in Him. We're going to come back to that. The second is that you can ask Him for salvation. There are things God wants you to ask for. But the third is His will. He says in John 6, and this is the will, the Father's will which hath sent me, that all which He hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of Him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. And you think about how weak of a God would it be that could say, well, here's everlasting life. Well, just kidding. I lost, oops, I didn't have the power to keep that and raise you up at the last day. Salvation includes the salvation of your soul in the resurrection. And when you, when you understand that that is essential doctrine, when you understand that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is just the tip of the iceberg, that's what will happen to us one day. Yeah. And it was a guaranteed thing that God would raise, raise His Son. Right. And so is it of us. He will not lose anything. Amen. He's not going to lose you. Right. Look, turn to Romans chapter 10. In John 4, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink. Thou would have has asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Right. This is talking about salvation. Yeah. The Bible is clear. If you want to be saved, you can ask God to be saved, and he will save you. He has offered you 
a free gift. If, if I'm handing out, we have gift Bibles. I don't know if I have any in the pulpit. Here's one a child drew on. Anybody want a free Bible? You want a free Bible? All you had to do was say, sure, give it to me. It's yours. That was easy. And salvation is the same way. God compares it to a free gift. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to clean up your life to get it. Now, once you become a son of God, if you don't clean up your life, boy, God will correct you. God will chastise you. If you think you can keep living like the world and not get spanked by your father, you're wrong. God loves you. He doesn't want you to be a hypocrite. He doesn't want you to look like the world. But listen, salvation is not based on how you look. It's not based on how you act. It's what's in your heart. And Jesus said this will be evident by what comes out of your mouth. You'll be justified by your words or you'll be condemned by them. And if you say, well, I know it's a free gift and I know it's freely available, but I just don't think it lasts forever. Well, what kind of gift are we talking about here? I mean, seriously, what kind of a gift? Everything in this world is going to burn up, but your soul will last forever somewhere in heaven or hell. Listen, God wants us to understand it's up to us while we're alive. And the decisions you make in the body have eternal consequences. In Matthew 7, Jesus made the point. He said, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him? You can and you should ask God to save your soul. What, wash away thy sins. Calling upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says. How do you get rid of your sin? You ask God. Hey, you got a free gift? I need that. We all need that. Look at Romans 10 where you're at. Verse number 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Now look, the Bible teaches without faith it's impossible to please God. What it's saying here, it's in your mouth. Are you going to say it? Do you believe that? This is what we preach. It's the words showing your faith. Look at verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The Bible is so clear on this. It comes out of your mouth if it's really in your heart. Now listen, there are fake people out there. There are these one, two, three, repeat after me or repent after me. Are you willing to give up all your sins? Say a prayer, right? There are a bunch of false prophets out there and most churches don't evangelize. Most churches don't go out and preach the gospel. But there was this Pentecostal church in Fort Worth and they would make YouTube videos. They would go around and they had literally, I mean, a card no bigger than this full of verses. And they would go around to the homeless and say, well, uh, do you know you're a sinner? Okay. Uh, you know Jesus, right? Okay. Uh, do you want to ask Jesus to save you? I mean, they don't tell them who Jesus is. They don't explain everlasting life. They don't explain the eternal consequences or hell. They don't preach the gospel. Listen, when, it, when I preach the gospel to somebody, it takes 30 to 40 minutes, right? And if they choose to believe what the Bible says, not what I say, but what the scriptures say that I show them, and they choose to ask God to save them, they're forever saved. It's forever settled in heaven. Their name is in the book and it will not be blotted out. But these people that go around and do that, oh, well, here, just say this real quick. Just repeat after me and we'll, we'll give you a free meal. And they go around saying this to the homeless and they want to pat themselves on the back and they get that same homeless person saved again every week because they don't believe in eternal security. They don't believe that gift really does last forever. They're just trying to be seen of men. So listen, it's not a prayer that saves you. It's not magical words that get you into heaven. It's you understanding the gospel and trusting on that in your heart. If you don't really trust that God really meant what He said, then it's not going to do you any good. You can give me lip service. You can tell me whatever you want. And I'll go, I'll go on down the road. I'll leave you alone. But if it's not right in your heart, you will end up in hell. Right. It's your choice. Look, where are you at? In uh, Romans 10, verse 9, we just read it. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe with thine heart that God, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You have to understand the resurrection. In uh, Romans 10, 10, it says, For with the heart... Man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. This is a very, very important verse. Now, in Romans 3, we know that it says there are none righteous, no, not one. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. I don't always do the right thing. In fact, I've broken God's law. I'm worthy of death. I deserve both death and hell, right? The lake of fire. But the Bible says, I have believed and therefore I have spoken. We also believe and therefore we have spoken. Now that I understand 
the free gift that I don't have to go to hell because Jesus went for me. Now that I understand that and I've taken that gift, I want you to know that. I want you to understand what Jesus did for you and therefore I speak. So when it says when the heart man believeth, it starts inside of here. There are many religions today that confuse this. Well, you can't, you can't understand that without going to a priest. You got to go to the Pope. You got to go to your pastor and ask him, and he's going to tell you about what he learned in seminary. And listen, that is confusing the gospel. That is muddying the water. The water should be clear. The, the, the gospel should be simple, so simple, a child can understand it. And you think about that. Jesus made that comparison that if, that if we would become his children, right? And a child blindly trusts you for everything. Daddy, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I need something to eat right now. They don't think out the logistics of how you're going to provide dinner. They don't think out well, how much taxes you're going to lose in your paycheck. They don't even understand that. They can't comprehend it, but they know that daddy's going to take care of them. And you, as a believer, come to God saying, well, you know, I don't get all the logistics of how you poured your blood on the mercy seat. I understand how they knew that the lamb back here was a picture of you out here, but you know what? I take it on faith. And I trust in that and in that alone. I do not trust in my ability to endure to the end. I don't trust in my ability to stop sinning because frankly, I can't stop sinning. I'm a human being, right? I believe what the Bible has said and that is if you put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ, Amen. you will be saved Amen. and it lasts forever. Amen. Forever. It's, it's our faith. It's our choice. It starts in our heart. And listen, there are those out there that would say, well, it's not really your faith. God gives you that faith, but that's not true. The disciples asked and said, Lord, help our, and strengthen our faith, right? The man said, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. We have to make the choice for ourselves. We can't just say, well, I trust that God will give me the faith. I have to say, well, you know what? That's what he says. I'm going to take it at face value. I want that free gift. I want to be saved. Look at verse number 11. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Now listen, he said at this time when he was writing this, he's saying he's trying to shut some bad doctrine down. Hey, there's people out here saying it's just for the Jews. It's not for the Gentiles. Now not only, not only was it racist, and God is not a racist, God is not a respecter of persons, yeah. but basically they were saying God only died for certain people. These other people over here, we don't like them. So we're going to say God didn't die for them. We're not going to preach to them. And that's wicked as hell. Yeah, the Bible's clear that he died for all men. He died for the sins of the whole world. And yes, people will reject that. People will end up in hell. He's offered forgiveness and they denied it. I mean, that's their choice. But it doesn't change the fact that Jesus died for them. And people that have this mentality of an elitist that, well, you know, he only died for the Jews, or I'm a Hebrew roots and I'm saved different than you Christians, or even the Catholics will do this, and the, you know, they have their special way, and the Calvinists will do it, and all these groups have their own special little way, and they like to say, it's only for us. And, you know, our gospel is right because we do it according to the Bible. If you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't care who you are, where you come from, it, it counts. God died for you, he died for all men, it's available to you. Now, if you choose to become a reprobate, Hey, that's your choice, but that free gift was still available to you. You had to turn it down. You had to reject it to become a reprobate. Look at verse 13. For whosoever, that's anybody, whosoever, how much clearer could you be? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Could you imagine a gospel that says, well, if you don't fit certain parameters, then you're not in the whosoever category. Well, I mean, God died, but you're not Jewish, so forget about you. I mean, you think about how strange... These people had, I mean, how, how hard their heart would have to be to pervert the gospel and say that God doesn't love everybody, that he didn't die for everybody. Look, look at verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You know, we spoke last week about a doctrine called unconditional election, about those that would actually say, well, you don't have to do anything to be saved. It just happens. God just forced it on you, and there was no condition. Well, actually, it says the condition here is you have to hear it yeah. to be able to believe it. Right. And if you don't believe it, then you can't be saved. Right. So there are conditions. You have to know what God said to be able to re reject Him. And, you know, I would ask you, do you believe that Jesus died for everybody? Do you believe that He's offered this free gift to you? 
Because this is very important doctrine. When he says everlasting life, do you believe it lasts forever? These are very important questions that, like, again, the world has made confusing. Yeah. They want to make you jump through a hoop. They want to make you join their club. They want to make you think you're special if you just read a book written by a man rather than the Bible. And that's confusing. Yeah. Look yeah. at verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now go back to 1 John chapter 5. How shall they preach except they be sent? You were sent out preaching today and 19 people got saved Amen. because of their choice, because the free gift was available to all. Listen, we're having a soul winning mega marathon in March and it's up to us to choose to preach. It's up to them to choose to listen. And this is happening in every city across America. Every major city is going to have soul winning in America on March 31st. And this is the revival everybody's been praying for. But most people say, Lord, send us revival. God says, no, you need to send preachers and then I'll revive you again. That's what he's saying. You need to go out. You need to open your mouth. You need to open your Bible. You need to tell them what I did for you. Amen. And people act like it's just this mysterious thing. God's going to hit his wand and all of a sudden people are going to turn their hearts back to him. It happens through preachers that proclaim the gospel. It's the only way. And there are people out there that are anti-missionary. Well, God's going to pick anyway, so why should we even go out? That's not true. That's a lie. That is a lie. They're, they all oh, with that great commission, that's not for us. That was a different dispensation or that's for the Jew. No. You are called to preach. If you're a Christian, it's your responsibility to preach. In 2 Corinthians 4, he says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You understand that the God of this physical world, the devil, is trying to blind minds. He's trying to keep people from hearing the gospel. He works on it full time, every day. And we have part time soul winning. Can we catch up? Yeah. Hey, there's more of us than there are him. We have the power of God on our side. Right? He has all power and He's committed us, therefore we go. Mm -hmm. So listen, we can overcome this, this, this deception in the world. But you know, hey, like today, there was, there was a problem with football. Right? Brother Graham's telling me, he's in the street, he hasn't even made it up to the house yet, and this guy comes out, I don't have time, I don't have time, the game's coming on. Are you kidding me? I can't talk about the eternal destiny of my soul. I don't want to know what God has to say because the Fadwars are playing. We're going to worship this football team. Man, what a scourge on Jacksonville that you can't, nobody will even come to their door and listen to what the Bible says because they're worshiping football. You want to talk about idolatry? You want to talk about covetousness? You want to talk about honoring a bunch of perverts? A bunch of strange, you know, I mean, these people are not godly. But yet you teach your children, these are good people. You elevate them, these are the people you should respect. Put their picture on your wall. It's a shame. It is a shame. And I can't wait until football season is over. Then maybe we can help Jacksonville a little bit better. But hey, we're, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep preaching. In John 1.12 he says, But as many as, as, he says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. If you have not put your trust totally in Jesus Christ, you are not a son of God. But God gave you that power to become a son of God. He gave you that choice to choose whether or not you trust it or not. In John 3, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, ye must be born again. Now you're in John chapter, 1 John 5. Look at verse number 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. So as we go into this, understand the verses we just read. Jesus said you must be born again. And now here we are at the end of the Bible in 1 John where it's reiterating whatever is born of God overcometh the world. This is not talking about being born again in the flesh. This is in the Spirit. This happened when you heard the Gospel and believed. Look what he says. And this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith. Wait, did that say his faith or our faith? Did God force that faith on me and say, I picked you to be special? 
You're, you're elect. You're Jewish. You're born into this family. Therefore, you're one of mine. Is that what God's teaching here? No. No. He says our faith. The victory to overcome this world and go on to heaven to the next world is our own personal faith. Our own decisions. And that would go against total depravity as we learned last week. Look at verse 5. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? How do we overcome this world? We believe that Jesus is God, that He is our Savior, that He is the Messiah. Then we go to heaven when we trust on Him. In John 3.36 it says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Those that choose to reject the Gospel and say, well, no, I don't, I don't like your free gift analogy. I don't, I don't like the fact that I'm responsible to choose. I think God picked me. God says the wrath of God will abide upon you. If you choose to continue to reject what God has offered you, God's just going to say, okay, there comes a point where you're just too proud. You won't humble yourself as a child and acknowledge the Scriptures. There does come a point where God will reject you. If you believe the Gospel of Jesus Christ, you are saved. If you, believe, if you trust in the doctrine of men, and I don't care who it is, I don't, Luther or Calvin or any of these other men, you will be damned. They have perverted the Gospel. The Bible says, let them be accursed. They preached another Gospel. Look at verse 14 in this chapter. And this is the confidence that we have in Him. Right? I told you we were going to come back to this. This is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. Right, so our confidence is in His promise. In Titus 1, he says that in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So God made me a promise. I can have everlasting life. That's His promise. Do I believe that? Am I confident in what He said? Am I confident He can fulfill? Can you imagine having a boss that says, hey, next week I'm going to give you a raise. Do you trust your boss? Do you believe it's going to happen? I mean, are you, are you going ahead and spending that money before you get the check? Because that's the kind of God that we have, right? He wants us to be confident in Him. That He has said it, it will come true. In John 10, He says that no man will pluck you out of His hand. And you are a man. You are not capable of doing something to cause you to lose your salvation. When He said everlasting life, He meant it. He's not lying. Our confidence in everlasting life is not my ability to endure to the end. My confidence is in the promise that He made me and I know that he can't lie. It's impossible for God to lie. Amen. I trust that. He's bigger than me. When I get to heaven, I'm not going to get up there and say, but I live for you and I work for you and I knock doors and I talk to people and I preach the gospel. I'm going to say, God, you made a promise. And that's all I trust in. Yes. That's the only thing I can come to him with is, hey, I trusted in what you said. Why should, I, why should you let me in? Because you said so. And I believed it. That's the only thing we have. Look at verse 10 in this chapter. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made God a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. There are people that will hear and reject. God says, you're making me a liar. Seriously. If I, if I offer you that Bible and you just say, meh, I don't think you're really, no, call me a liar. No, I said it's free. No, it's for you. I get, it's just free. Call me a liar then. I'll hold on to it. You think about how God is saying, you might as well spit in God's face when you reject the gospel. You're just saying, nah, that sounds too easy. Oh, but God, I'm prepared to do work. God says, I don't want you to be prepared to do work. You know, there are a lot of people, I think, that are, that are married with their spouse and they, they're not really sure about their spouse. And God wants us to be sure. He wants us to know for sure. And sometimes we don't bring up this conversation which is why I think it's very important as soul winners that we become strengthened in it. Not just for your own household, but for your family. Your extended family. For the strangers that you come across. You need to step on some people's toes sometimes. And you may offend them, but it's worth it. I ha I've had people report back to me in this church, well, you know what? I was a little offended, but brother so-and-so said, am I sure I'm a Christian? How do you know? But I'm glad he did. Sure. That's kind of refreshing. I haven't heard that in years since people actually cared enough to know if I'm saved. That's right. why, I mean, why not just let them in? Join the club. Have a seat. Get comfortable. Give us your money. We don't care about your soul. 
That's wicked. That's all these other churches. I care about the souls in Jacksonville, Florida. We're going to go out preaching the gospel. And we have to understand the foundation. The gift you're offering lasts forever. Amen. If they don't believe that, they miss the whole boat. Look at verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He, this is so simple, listen to this. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Look, don't be confused by religion. Listen to your Bible. It's your choice. If you have Jesus Christ, if you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you are saved forever. So many people, when I, when I talk to people out soul winning, there's two things they mess up on. One, that it's free. And the other is that it's everlasting. If you can wrap your mind around those two things, you got it. It's that simple. And God will empower you. God will give you everlasting life. He that hath the Son hath life. Now again, we have to humble ourselves and trust God. Some people have to come to a point in their life where you know what, I grew up for years thinking I was a Christian. I thought I was saved, but I always wondered. I always doubted. I would get, you know, I'd look back, well, was it when I was five? When it, was it when I was 10? When I was 15? When I was 20? I don't know. I'm just going to keep on floating. I'm going to keep skating by and just say, oh yeah, I'm still, I'm saved. How? When? What have you believed? What have you trusted in? Doesn't matter if you don't, don't know the date. The point is, do you know today that in your heart, 100% for sure, you've trusted, it's a free gift and it lasts forever. It's only through Jesus and you cannot lose it, no matter what. Look at verse, actually flip back to 1 John chapter 4. Your salvation is finished at the moment you trust that God made you that promise. 1 John chapter 4 verse 16. And we have known and believed. Known and believed. I want you to think about this. We started out talking about that you would know that you have eternal life. Right? God wants you to know and believe. How will they hear? Right? They got to hear from a preacher. Once they hear it, they have to believe. It's their choice. So look, he says, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that me, we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as He is, so are we in the world. Again, when I'm judged, I can't tell God what I did. All I can claim is what Jesus did. I know for a fact He died for my sins. I trust on that more than anything else. That's all I've got. I will have boldness in judgment because my faith and my trust is not in my ability to endure sinless to the end of my life. My faith and my trust is that He already finished it. And no matter how I finish my race, I'm already saved. He finished it for me. My name's in the book because I've trusted Him. Look at verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. There are people that are unsettled in their salvation. They are afraid. They understand there's torment. They're conflicted. And if you love them, you'll tell them the truth. If you love them, you'll prove to them out of the Bible they can know for sure. That's our job. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. You must decide for yourself if you believe the record of the Son, the Gospel. In Ephesians 3, he says, In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him. Once you have faith, you have boldness in judgment. It doesn't matter what sins you've committed, they've been forgiven. Our confidence, our confidence is in Him alone. Our confidence is that our faith is sufficient, not our lifestyle. Not our works. If you're trusting in works, you have nothing to be confident in. Yes. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse number 6. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. 
Listen, he's saying here, if you're saved, this is a sure thing. You know as soon as you die, you're going to be with God. The person that would say, I'm afraid to die, I would, I would say they're probably afraid because they're not saved. They're not confident when they leave this body where they're going. They're not sure. They don't know it for a fact. They have not trusted in the Lord alone. They're still trusting in themselves. They're still trusting in their ability. And there are a lot of religions that teach this. It's like, well, God opened the door. He gave me the gift, now I have to maintain it. And that's, that is not what the Bible teaches. He paid for it all or He paid for nothing. Look at verse 9. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, whether to that he hath done, or whether it be good or bad. So again, once you're saved, you're always saved, but once you're saved, you ought to do good because God, well, you have to answer for that. You will be rewarded for obeying God and you will lose reward if you don't. Knowing therefore, verse 11, this is so important. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Go to 2 Corinthians 4. Go back a chapter. Look, he says, because I know the terror of God, because I know that hell is real, we persuade men. This is not popular. This is not fun. I've sat down with a family member recently, and I, I had believed that they were saved, but I was probably only 80% sure of their salvation. And I, I had to, hey, look, you know, sorry I had to bring this up. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I need to know what you're trusting in to get to heaven. Oh, come on, you know. <laughs> No, I don't, actually. I want to hear it out of your mouth. The Bible says you'll be judged by your words. You're going to be justified by your words. I, want, I love you so much, I want to make sure that you really are trusting in God alone. Well, you know, I mean, we always... No, 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 come on. Come on. I'm going to step on your toes a little bit because I love you. I'd rather offend you a little bit now than to find out you end up in hell. I don't want to hear that. I would rather you be mad at me for a week because I even dared to ask that question. But the truth is, once you cross that line, they love you. Yeah, you're right. Thank you for asking. I know I'm not in church. I know I haven't been acting right. Hey, but how's your heart? You, do you really believe? Do you believe that? Because there are people that may look like a Christian and 10 years later, what what do you what'd you do to get saved? And they'll tell you, well, I'm not good anymore. I'd probably go to hell. Well, guess what? You never were a Christian. You didn't believe in everlasting life. You don't have everlasting life. We're commanded to preach the gospel. We are commanded to obey the gospel by trusting God, by our faith. And scoffers will say you can't just teach from the Bible and people will get saved. They try to make it very complicated. They try to make it confusing. But God, again, He says it's simple. He says it's our responsibility. Why else would God have sent prophets all along? Yeah. Trying to preserve nations. Trying to keep them from the downward slope that America is in today. We need more preachers to stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord. So we, hey, look, like we preached this morning, God has given you a covenant. If you choose to believe it, you'll be blessed. If not, you will be cursed. Right. And now we have a nation full of perverts. We need more people to stand up. Look, he says in verse 13, We, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that He which raised up the Lord shall raise us up also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Turn back to 1 John chapter 5 and we'll be done. <laughs> so look, He makes this point. Because you believed, now you speak. Right? Now that you're saved, how did you get saved? Somebody believed it and they told you. Now you hear it, it goes into your heart. Hey, that makes sense. Now I want to tell somebody else. You ought to have this desire to be evangelistic to preach the gospel, to be a prophet of God. In 2 Timothy verse one, chapter 1, he says, Wherefore I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. He's making this point here. God has given me these ministries and these responsibilities, and all of them deal with giving the gospel, with teaching the gospel, teaching the doctrines of the Bible. And knowing that salvation is a free gift and available to everyone, now you have a responsibility. Now you have a burden Obey that commandment. Go tell somebody else. We preach. We persuade men because God wants us to. Look, He's not going to open up the sky and show Himself. He's not going to reveal Himself in a dream. He wants you to open up your mouth. Right. And our spirit will bear witness with their spirit if they believe. 
The Holy Spirit works through us. He says, For the which cause I also suffered these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I am persuaded that the destination of my soul I have committed it unto the Lord because He made me a promise. I am persuaded of that. I believed it. And now God says, okay, go teach others. Now that you believe that, go and tell more people. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Look at verse 20 at the end of the chapter here. And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. And we are in Him that is true, even His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God. And temporary life? Is that what it says? No. Eternal life. God wants you to understand this. He's given you the understanding. He's given you the Word. He's given you the power of His Holy Spirit. That's right. Do you believe that? Yes. Do you trust in that? Are you willing to say, yeah, I know where I'm going. I'm 100% sure. Now take these verses and share them with other people. You are responsible for persuading men. You are responsible to reconcile men unto God by showing them the Scriptures. That's our job as a Christian. Let's pray. Father God, thank You for Your Word. Lord, thank You for this church and the amazing things that You're doing here. Lord, I just, I just humbly ask that You would continue to bless us and protect us and give us, give us life and health and, Lord, more babies and all the things you've given us this year so far. Lord, we look forward to what you have in store for us. I just pray that you would help us to stay motivated and get up and rise early and proclaim the gospel to people as you've told us to. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.